Just in time for Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day, we're going to be talking about the most simple of image capturing devices, the pinhole camera. I mean, look at this thing. It doesn't even have a lens. Hey fellow photographers, what did you shoot today? Now as we discussed in our Camera Obscura video, if you make a small hole in the wall here, you get a projection of the outside world. So here we have our tree and we have our small hole in the wall and it's being projected out here. Now this is the base of the Camera Obscura that we talked about. But what if we take like a piece of film or some sort of photosensitive surface and we, we, we put it somewhere along this axis here? Well, we can actually record the image that we see from the outside world that gets projected onto this film. And this is really the basis of the pinhole camera. Now, I mentioned before that the hole here has to be small because think about a big window opening, right? You have a lot of light coming in and you look out the window in your everyday life and you know, there's no projection of the outside world on the wall. So you have to, the hole has to be really, really small. And the smaller the hole is, the sharper the image becomes. But there's a limit to this and let's talk about why. Okay, so what I've drawn here is a pinhole, right? So this, this is our little opening. Here's a film plane or a sensor that we're gonna capture the image on. And here's a point out in space that we're interested in. Now this point is giving off rays of lights in all direction, but the only ones that are gonna hit this plane are the ones that make it through the pinhole, like this. And what happens here is that we get basically a projection of this point onto this film plane. So this is like a blurry spot. Now, if you imagine a picture made up of points, the smaller this blurry spot is, the more resolution you're gonna have on that picture. So you would think you would wanna make this opening as small as possible to make this blurry spot as small as possible. But that's not quite the case because when things interact, when light beams interact with an obstacle, kind of like ripples in a pond, what's going to happen is that they're going to, they're going to sort of bend around this obstruction. And this is due to diffraction. So you're also going to get some other sort of light waves that are going to go out in either direction. And the smaller the hole, the more pronounced this effect. So you're going to have a high concentration of light in this area. But you're also going to get some residual effects. And they're actually going to come up in, in a specific pattern that we'll talk about later. So you can't make the hole too small because you're going to have these diffraction effects. But you still want to get this hole pretty small because you want to have the most resolution possible. So there's a trade-off between the blurry spot due to the geometric shape of this pinhole and there's another trade-off between the diffraction that occurs from a pinhole that's too small. So let's investigate these further. Okay, so here's our setup from before, and we kind of want to know what is the size of this blurry spot. Let's just call this X. So this is X is the diameter of the blurry spot that hits the sensor or film that we're looking at. So we know that the distance between these two parts of the pinhole, and this is a cross section, right? So this is the size of the hole. So this is, we'll call it D for our diameter of the pinhole. Now, if we draw a line straight down the middle, like this, we get a couple different sections. Now we have to define what this area is and what this area is. Now, when you hear people talk about pinhole cameras, they often mention focal length as the distance between the pinhole and the film plane. And it's not really a focal length per se, it's more of a projection distance. But for the sake of argument, because where you move this film plane is going to affect the angle of view of the pinhole, we can think of it as a focal length. So it's really a projection length, but we'll just call it focal length for now. So we're gonna call this distance F for focal length. And we have our subject out here, so we're going to call this distance from the pinhole to the subject, S. Okay, so we're interested in what this diameter is, which we've called X. So let's take a look at just one of these triangles. And we notice that we can use similar triangles because they share this angle over here. We can use similar triangles to find out what this is. 
So we look at this triangle here, which is going to be this part here, which is one half of the diameter of the pinhole in relation to this side of the triangle, which is S, is equal to this side over here, which is one half of X, to the entire length of that triangle, which is S plus F. So we can move some things around, right? So we can cross multiply. So we get one half D, we can move this over here. S plus F is still divided by S is equal to one half X. And then we just multiply both sides by two. So we get that X is equal to D times S plus F over S. So this is the size of the diameter of the blurry spot on the film plane in relation to the focal length, the subject distance, and the diameter of the pinhole. Now, sometimes by convention, we look at this S over S is one, and F over S, the focal length divided by the subject distance, is the magnification factor. So sometimes you can see this seen as X, the blurry spot diameter, is equal to diameter of the pinhole times one plus M, where M is F over S, the magnification factor. Okay, so we discussed what the blur spot would be due to geometric properties. Now let's look at the effects of diffraction. So here we kind of have similar setup, but we're not worried about what's going on out here anymore. We're just looking at once the light hits this small hole, it creates this diffraction pattern. What are the effects of that diffraction on the blur spot that happens at the film plane? So again, we're gonna be looking at, I guess we can call it, you know, we can still call it X, which would be the diameter of the blur spot, but this time it's due to diffraction. So we're curious as to what happens when diffraction affects the light coming into the pinhole. So we still have the same focal length as before, F, and we still have this blur spot, X. But we have to go to really complex math and physics and, and uh, solutions to differential equations uh, in order to solve for this. So from physics we know that this diffraction pattern is gonna cause an interference pattern known as an airy disk. And this airy disk is basically a bunch of concentric circles of varying intensities. Now you can imagine as light enters, it's gonna be most bright in the center, but because of the interference of the different waves, we're gonna see different rings of varying intensities propagating out from the center. So this is what an airy disk looks like. Now physics defines the distance between the center and the first minimum of the airy disk, which is going to be this one half x, kind of like from before, as the sine of the angle that's made here. And that's gonna be equal to 1.22 times the wavelength of light, lambda, divided by the diameter of the pinhole. So we know from trigonometry that the sine of an angle is the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. But the fact is that these angles are so small and so tiny that we can approximate this hypotenuse distance as the focal length between the pinhole and the film plane. So if we take that into consideration, then we can say that this distance here, which we've labeled one half of x, because remember x is the entire diameter of the blur area. So one half of x over f is equal to, so this is what sine theta is. So we're gonna equal 1.22 wavelength over diameter. So now all we have to do is solve this for x. So we take f to the other side and multiply by two, which gives us x equals 2.44 times wavelength over diameter times the focal length. Now here we can see where a small diameter can actually hurt our resolution because this is what this is saying. The diameter of this blurry spot is going to get bigger as the diameter of the pinhole gets smaller. A smaller number in the, di in the diameter is gonna to lead to a bigger number over here. So you can see from before, if we compare from what we had before, where x is equal to d times one plus m, 
a smaller diameter is going to result in a smaller geometric size of this diameter. So a smaller diameter here is good, a smaller diameter here is bad. So there should be some optimal trade-off between the two values. All right, so we've established that a smaller diameter creates a smaller geometric blur, which is good for resolution. But on the other hand, a smaller diameter creates a larger blur due to diffraction, which is bad for our resolution. So there should be some sort of optimum between these. So if we have a blur that's due to geometry, right, we have that D times 1 plus M, and we have a blur that's due to diffraction as 2.44 lambda over D times F. We have a total blur as the addition of these two things. Now we want to try and find a minimum for this function. So we're going to use calculus. We're going to differentiate with respect to the pinhole diameter. So if we take d dd of this function here, what we're going to get is 1 plus m minus 2.44 lambda over d squared times f. Now if you're not familiar with calculus, that's fine. Just take this at face value that in order to find the minimum, we're going to use calculus, differentiate with the variable that we're interested in. And then what we're going to do to find the minimum is set this equal to zero. So if we set, we want this to equal zero. So it seems simple enough. We take, leave this here, move this to the other side. So we're going to get one plus M is equal to 2.44 lambda over D squared F. We want to solve for d, so we're going to multiply by d squared, and then we're going to divide by 1 plus m, and we're going to get d squared is equal to 2.44 lambda times f over 1 plus m. And then we just take the square root of d, so we get d, the optimal pinhole diameter, is equal to the square root of all of this, so 2.44 lambda f over 1 plus m. So for a given focal length and a wavelength of light that we're interested in, and we'll talk about this later, but for a given focal length, a wavelength of light, and a certain subject distance, we can find an optimal pinhole diameter that should give us the sharpest image. It's going to be a compromise between the geometric blur and the blur due to diffraction. All right, so let's take our solution from before. And let's point out one interesting feature. So a lot of times when you see pinhole photographs, you're not really necessarily worried about the subject distance, right? Because you just want to try and get everything in focus out to the horizon, out to infinity. So if your subject distance is like, like a landscape and it's out to infinity, this actually becomes much more simple. So remember that M is equal to F over the subject distance S. So if we look at this in an expanded form, we see that d is equal to the square root of 2.44 lambda f over 1 plus f over s. And as the subject distance gets bigger and bigger and bigger, further and further away, this number gets large, which means that something over a large number is going to tend towards 0. So this will go away completely. And that this numerator, anything divided by 1 is itself. So if if this number here is infinity, if you're looking out towards the horizon, this simplifies to simply d equals square root of 2.44 lambda f. So for infinity focus, this equation becomes much more simple. But it's important to note that you can actually find small subject distances and do macro photography with pinhole cameras. So let's look at this visually and see what this looks like. So here we have that same equation, but I've taken the magnification factor and just replaced it with f over s, like we've been talking about. And a very close subject distance, the opposite of a landscape at infinity, something very close is going to make this fraction bigger. And because this is bigger and it's in the denominator of this fraction, right, it's going to make this entire thing smaller. Right? So you actually need a smaller, and if this is smaller, this is going to be smaller. So what might be good for landscapes is not going to be good for close-ups, and here's why. So here's our pinhole, 
and we have something way out here, right? That, that gets that narrow, wow, that was terrible. <laughs> so here's our pinhole, right? We have something way out here. So it's gonna have a narrow, narrow beam of light that enters it. So if it's way out here, we want the pinhole to be small to make this beam small. But if something's right up close to this pinhole, look at what happens at the rays of light that this produces. It's gonna go like this, right? Because it's so close, it's able to actually make a really large projection. So if we wanna focus on something very, very close, we're gonna need an even smaller pinhole, very, very tiny, so that only a little bit of light gets through for this very, very close object. So remember, if you're gonna do some macro photography, take this into account. But if you wanna do landscape, sort of everything in, in, in relatively good focus out to infinity, this becomes much more simple and you only have to worry about the top part. So let's put some real numbers to the situation. Um, so I built this camera, this is a four x five pinhole camera and I wanted to make sure that the pinhole size was going to be optimal for the focal length, um, which is in this case, it's about uh, 65 millimeters. And I wanted to make sure it was optimal for that focal length and for what I wanted to do, which was take landscapes with this exact camera. So because I want to do landscapes, like I talked about before, this magnification factor, which is F over S, S, the subject distance, is way out in the distance in infinity. So this is actually going to go away. So the equation that I was solving was D is equal to 2.44 lambda F. Now I told you that the focal length of this camera that I built is 65 millimeters. Now we want everything in the same unit, so I'm going to stick to millimeters. Now, we haven't talked about what lambda is, but lambda is the wavelength of light. And light in the visual spectrum basically goes from right around 400 nanometers, which is like your deep violets, almost ultraviolet, up until about 700 nanometers, which is red. Anything past that is the infrared spectrum. So because the wavelengths of light go from, we'll use some color coordination here, about 400, to 700, so blue violet to red. You want to pick something that's kind of in the middle. So something that's smack dab in the middle is 550 nanometers, and that's about green. So that's what I use. Um, there's some research that says that 555 is what is most perceptible to the human eye. Uh, but most people use values for the middle of the range between 550 and 560 nanometers. So remember I said everything has to be in the same units. So 550 nanometers is actually equal to 0 0.00055 millimeters. So remember everything has to be in the same units. You can't just multiply straight through. So what I do is I take these two numbers and I plug it into our fancy theoretically derived equation and I get that the diameter of pinhole I need should be equal to the square root of 2.44 times 0 0.00055 times 65. So this is in millimeters, this is in millimeters, so we're going to get millimeters squared, but we're taking the square root of millimeters squared, so we get millimeters back out, and it turns out that D is equal to zero point, and I wrote this down, 29534 millimeters. Now there's no way you're gonna get exactly that. The, the precision of that is so small. We're talking fractions of millimeters. So what did I do? I went on eBay and I bought a pinhole with a 0 0.3 millimeter diameter, because that's pretty darn close. So uh, we'll talk about making your own pinhole, but if you, if you have a specific application, it might help to do this calculation and find out what you need, and then go find someone that actually makes precision pinholes. And usually they come in, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 millimeter increments. So try and get close. And if you're designing your camera, sort of take that into account as well. So how well did this camera do after I built it, put in the theoretically sort of closest to the best size pinhole I could? 
and took some test shots. Well, in typical Neeps fashion, I uh, went outside. Uh, you know, the view from the window at Le Gras became the view from my driveway looking outside and I took a few test shots. And I'm, I'm pretty pre pleased with the results. Um, now this is gonna be a straight out of camera scan. Um, but after, if you scan the negative and a little, a little bit of Photoshop later, you can actually get a pretty sharp image. Not bad for a tiny hole, considering how much uh, you spend on lenses and optics. Um, it's pretty impressive what you can get out of just a small pinhole. But the important point is that we're looking for that optimum between geometric blur and blur to diffraction that's going to give us the best result. And there is a lot of science behind it. So pinhole cameras are great. I mean, even though they're very simple in concept, there's a lot of math that goes behind finding the, the image that's going to give you the best picture. Now, is the best picture everything? No, because the pinhole camera has a certain aesthetic. It's a little bit soft pretty much everywhere, but it gives you a nice depth of field and you can get some really artistic effects. But if you really want to get the most out of your pinhole camera, there is some math that you should do in order to find those optimum pinhole diameters. And I tell you what, the reason I built this camera and I'm planning to build a few more that are even larger than this is because this is a really cheap way to get into large format photography. You don't even need lenses. You just need a light proof box. You know, it's, it's all blacked out in here and light tight. All you need is a box, poke a hole in it, or in this case, I bought this little pinhole because I knew what size I needed. And if you do that, you can get stunning images without the need for big lenses, expensive glass, all that kind of stuff. So all you gotta do is, is you know, build, build the box, and get some film, and, uh, and go out and shoot. I mean, it doesn't really make like a shutter clicking sound. You kind of just cover your hand and let the light in and then close, uh, close it down. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's actually a lot of fun. A lot of fun getting to learn uh, how to shoot with these cameras because I mean, this is photography at its essence. It's, it's the camera obscura plus film. And uh, you can get some really unique stuff. So in future videos, we're going to talk about how you can make your own pinholes if you don't want to buy them. Uh, we're going to talk about little tips and tricks you can use to make your own cameras. And we're going to talk about what makes good subject matter for pinhole photography. Uh, and remember that Pinhole Photography Day is Sunday, April 30th, 2017 of this year. And hopefully this will inspire you to go out and shoot that day if you don't have a pinhole camera. Uh, stick around. We're going to learn a lot and then I'll give you a whole year until next year uh, to participate. So if you haven't already, please subscribe so you stay up to date with all the new videos that are coming out. And uh, until then, happy shooting. Click. It doesn't really, doesn't really make a sound, so. Picture. Go.